Chapter Two of A Popular History of Ireland, Book One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betsy Bush in Marquette, Michigan, January 2008. A Popular History of Ireland from the Earliest Period to the Emancipation of the Catholics, Book One by Thomas Darcy McGee. Chapter Two The First Ages. Since we have no Roman accounts of the form of government or state of society in ancient Erin, we must only depend on the bards and storytellers, so far as their statements are credible and agree with each other. On certain main points they do agree, and these are the points which it seems reasonable for us to take on their authority. As even brothers born of the same mother, coming suddenly into possession of a prize, will struggle to see who can get the largest share, so we find in those first ages a constant succession of armed struggles for power. The petty princes who divided the island between them were called rye, a word which answers to the Latin rex and the French roi, and the chief king or monarch was called ard rye, or high king. The eldest nephew, or son of the king, was the usual heir of power, and was called the tanist, or successor, although any of the family of the prince, his brothers, cousins, or other kinsmen, might be chosen tanist, by election of the people over whom he was to rule. One certain cause of exclusion was personal deformity, for if a prince was born lame, or a hunchback, or if he lost a limb by accident, he was declared unfit to govern. Even after secession, any serious accident entailed deposition, though we find the names of several princes who managed to evade or escape the singular penalty. It will be observed, besides of the tanist, that the habit of appointing him seems to have been less a law than a custom, that it was not universal in all the provinces, that in some tribes the secession alternated between a double line of princes, and that sometimes, when the reigning prince obtained the nomination of a tanist, to please himself, the choice was set aside by the public voice of the clansmen. The successor to the Ard Rye, or monarch, instead of being simply called tanist, had the more sounding title of Roy Damna, or king successor. The chief offices about the kings, in the first ages, were all filled by the druids, or pagan priests. The brehans, or judges, were usually druids, as were also the bards, the historians, of their patrons. Then came the physicians, the chiefs who paid the tribute or received annual gifts from the sovereigns or princes, the royal stewards, and the military leaders or champions, who, like the knights of the Middle Ages, held their lands and their rank at court, by the tenure of the sword. Like the feudal dukes of France and barons of England, these military nobles often proved too powerful for their nominal patrons, and made them experience all the uncertainty of reciprocal dependence. The champions play an important part in all the early legends. Wherever there is trouble, you are sure to find them. Their most celebrated divisions were the warriors of the Red Branch, that is to say, the Militia of Ulster, the Fion, or Militia of Leinster, sometimes the Royal Guard of Terra, at others in exile and disgrace, the Clan de Gade of Munster, and the Fion of Connaught. The last force was largely recruited from the Belgic race, who had been squeezed into that western province by their Milesian conquerors, pretty much as Cromwell endeavoured to force the Milesian Irish into it, many hundred years afterwards. Each of these bands had its special heroes, its Godfreys and Orlandos celebrated in song. The most famous name in Ulster was Suchulian, so called from Su, a hound, or watchdog, and Ulian, the ancient name of his province. He lived at the dawn of the Christian era, of equal fame with Finn, the father of Osian, and the Fingal of modern fiction, who flourished in the latter half of the second century. Gaul, son of Morna, the hero of Connaught, one of the few distinguished men of Belgic origin whom we hear of through the Milesian bards, flourished a generation earlier than Finn, and might fairly compete with him in celebrity, if he had only had an Osian to sing his praises. The political boundaries of different tribes expanded or contracted with their good or ill fortune in battle. Immigration often followed defeat, 
so that a clan, or its offshoot, is found at one period on one part of the map, and again on another, as surnames were not generally used either in Ireland or anywhere else, till after the tenth century, the great families are distinguishable at first, only by their tribe or clan's name. Thus in the north we have the Hyneal race, in the south the Eugenian race, so called from Neil and Egan, their mutual ancestors. We have already compared the shape of Aaron to a shield, in which the four provinces represented the four quarters, some shields have also bosses, or centerpieces, and the federal province of Meath was the boss of the old Irish shield. The ancient Meath included both the present counties of that name, stretching south to the Liffey, and north to Armagh. It was the Mensal de Mesne, or board of the king's table. It was exempt from all taxes, except those of the Ard Rye, and its relations to the other provinces may be vaguely compared to those of the District of Columbia to the several states of the North American Union. Ulster might then be defined by a line drawn from Sligo Harbour to the mouth of the Boyne, the line being notched here and there by the royal Demesna of Meath. Leinster stretched south from Dublin, triangle-wise, to Waterford Harbour, but its inland line towards the west was never very well defined, and this led to constant border wars with Munster. The remainder of the south to the mouth of the Shannon composed Munster, the present county of Clare, and all west of the Shannon north to Sligo, and part of Cavan going with Connaught. The chief seats of power in those several divisions were Tara, for federal purposes, Emania, near Armagh, for Ulster, Leenan, for Leinster, Cashel, for Munster, and Crucian, now Rathcrogan in Roscommon, for Connaught. How the common people lived within these external divisions of power it is not so easy to describe. All histories tell us a great deal of kings and battles and conspiracies, but very little of the daily domestic life of the people. In this respect, the history of Aaron is much the same as the rest, but some leading facts we do know. Their religion in pagan times was what the moderns called Druidism, but what they called it themselves we know not. It was probably the same religion anciently professed by Tyr and Sidon, by Carthage, and their colonies in Spain, the same religion which the Romans have described as existing in great part of Gaul, and by their accounts we learn the awful fact that it sanctioned, nay demanded, human sacrifices. From the few traces of its doctrines, which Christian zeal was permitted to survive in the old Irish language, we see that Belus, or Crom, the god of fire, typified by the sun, was its chief divinity, that two great festivals were held in his honor on days answering to the first of May and last of October. There were also particular gods of poets, champions, artificers, and mariners, just as among the Romans and Greeks. Sacred groves were dedicated to these gods. Priests and priestesses devoted their lives to their service. The arms of the champion and the person of the king were charmed by them. Neither peace nor war was made without their sanction. Their own persons and their pupils were held sacred. The high place at the king's right hand and the best fruits of the earth and the waters were theirs. Old age revered them. Women worshipped them. Warriors paid court to them. Youth trembled before them. Princes and chieftains regarded them as elderly brethren. So numerous were they in Erin, and so celebrated, that the altars of Britain and western Gaul, left desolate by the Roman legions, were often served by hierophants from Erin, which even in those pagan days was known to all the Druidic countries as the sacred island. Besides the princes, the warriors, and the Druids, who were also the physicians, bards, and briands of the first ages, there were innumerable petty chiefs, all laying claim to noble birth and blood. They may be said, with the warriors and priests, to be the only freemen. The Bruis, or farmers, though possessing central legal rights, were an inferior caste, while of the artisans, the smiths and armorers only seem to have been of much consideration. The builders of those mysterious round towers, of which a hundred ruins yet remain, may also have been a privileged order. But the mill and the loom were servile occupations, left altogether to slaves, taken in battle, or purchased in the marketplaces of Britain. 
the task of the herdsman, like that of the farm laborer, seems to have devolved on the bondsmen, while the kern and the shuttle were left exclusively to the hands of the bondswomen. We need barely mention the names of the first Milesian kings, who were remarkable for something else than cutting each other's throats, in order to hasten on to the solid ground of Christian tunes. The principal names are Heber and Harriman, the crowned sons of Milesians. They at first divided the island fairly, but Harriman soon became jealous of his brother, slew him in battle, and established his own supremacy. Iriel the prophet was king and built seven royal fortresses, Tiernmas, in his reign, and the arts of dyeing in colors were introduced, and the distinguishing of classes by the number of colors they were permitted to wear was decreed. Olama, the wise, established the convention of Terra, which assembled habitually every ninth year, but might be called oftener. It met about the October festival in honor of Belus or Kram, Ikade invented or introduced a new species of wicker boats, called Kasa, and spent much of his time upon the sea. A solitary queen named Macha appears in the secession, from whom Armagh takes its name. Except Mab, the mythological queen of Connaught, she is the sole female ruler of Erin in the First Ages. Owen, or Eugene Moore, the Great, is remembered as the founder of the notable families who rejoice in the common name of Eugenians. Leary, of whom the fable of Midas is told with variations, Angus, whom the after-princes of Alba, Scotland, claimed as their ancestor, Ekid, the tenth of that name, in whose reign are laid the scenes of the chief mythological stories of Erin, such as the story of Queen Mab, the story of the sons of Asna, the death of Cuchulian, a counterpart of the Persian tale of Rustam and Sorab, the story of Fergus, son of the king, of Connor of Ulster, of the sons of Derry, and many more. We next meet with the first kings who led an expedition abroad against the Romans in Crimthan, surnamed Nianari, or Nair's hero, from the good genius who accompanied him on his foray. A well-planned insurrection of the conquered Belge cut off one of the Crimthians' immediate successors, with all his chiefs and nobles, at a banquet given on the Belgian plain, Moibolk in Cavan, and arrested for a century thereafter Irish expeditions abroad. A revolution and a restoration followed, in which Moran, the just judge, played the part of monk to his Charles the Second, Tuthal, surnamed the Legitimate. It was Tuathal who imposed the special tax on Leinster, of which we shall often hear, under the title of Burua, or Tribute. The legitimate was succeeded by his son, who introduced the Roman Lex Talianus, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, into the Brehon Code. Soon after, the Eugenian families of the south, strong in numbers, and led by a second Owen Moore, again halved the island with the ruling race, the boundary this time being the Esker, or ridge of land which can be easily traced from Dublin west to Galway. Oliad, a brave and able prince, succeeded in time to the southern half-kingdom, and planted his own kindred deep and firm in its soil, though the unity of the monarchy was again restored under Cormac Ola, or Longbeard. This Cormac, according to the legend, was in secret a Christian, and was done to death by the enraged and alarmed Druids, after his abdication and retirement from the world, A.D. 266. He had reigned full forty years, rivaling in wisdom and excelling in justice the best of his ancestors. Some of his maxims remain to us, and challenge comparison for truthfulness and foresight with most uninspired writings. Cormac's successors during the same century are of little mark, but in the next the expeditions against the Roman outposts were renewed with greater energy and on an increasing scale. Another Crimthan eclipsed the fame of his ancestor and namesake, Neil, called of the hostages, was slain on a second or third expedition into Gaul, A.D. 405, while Dathi, nephew and successor to Neil, was struck dead by lightning in the passage of the Alps, A.D. 428. It was in one of Neil's Gaelic expeditions that the illustrious captive was brought into Erin, for whom Providence had reserved the glory of its conversion to the Christian faith an event which gives a unity and a purpose to the history of that nation, which must always constitute its chief attraction to the Christian reader. 
End of chapter 2